Welcome to the 2022 Stroke Recovery News. This is the Summer Autumn Edition and is Volume 22, Issue 1. The contents of this document include post-stroke mood and emotional disturbances on pages 1 to 3, COVID-19 at home tests, page 4, wheelchair-friendly beaches, page 5, Stroke Recovery Association's 2022 Board of Directors on pages six to seven. On pages eight and nine, we have a number of photos of the organisation for the past 45 years, as we will be celebrating our 45th anniversary during 2022. On pages 10 to 12, we have the President's Report for 2021, followed on pages 13 to 14 by the Treasurer's Report. On page 15, we have an article which is about how stroke may have impacted your ability to work. Post-stroke mood and emotional disturbances, pharmacological therapy based on mechanisms. Mood and emotional disturbances are frequent symptoms in stroke survivors. These symptoms are distressing for both the patient and their caregivers and negatively influence the patient quality of life. Important mood emotional disturbances include post-stroke depression, post-stroke anxiety, post-stroke emotional incontinence, post-stroke anger proneness, and post-stroke fatigue. Underlying factors and predictors of these emotional disturbances partially overlap, but are still different. The relationship between these phenomena and lesion locations differ when considering the different emotional symptoms. Thus, these diverse emotional disturbances are pathophysiologically interrelated, but are different phenomena. Studies have shown that these emotional disturbances have negative impacts on patients' clinical outcomes. Post-stroke depression, for example, negatively influences later functional outcomes after stroke, decreases quality of life, leads to less efficient use of rehabilitation services, and increases mortality. Patients with post-stroke fatigue are more often unemployed, change their jobs, and fail to return to previous jobs than those without post-stroke fatigue. Although the overall negative impact of post-stroke emotional incontinence and post-stroke anger proneness are less marked than those of post-stroke depression, they still lead to distress and embarrassment, impair certain domains of patients' quality of life, and increase caregiver burden. Fortunately, these mood and emotional disturbances can be treated or prevented by various methods, including pharmacological therapy. In order to administer the proper therapy, we have to understand the similarities and differences between the phenomenologies and physiological mechanisms associated with these symptoms. Regrettably, these important symptoms have been underdiagnosed, neglected and understudied. Depression and depressive mood. Symptoms characteristic and prevalence. The symptoms of post-stroke depression or depressive symptoms include depressed mood, anhedonia loss of energy, decreased concentration and psychological issues. Although somatic symptoms such as decreased appetite and insomnia are common, they may in part be attributed to the stroke itself, medications or comorbid diseases. Guilty feelings and suicidal ideations are less common than observed in primary depression. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, has been used for the diagnosis of post-stroke depression. It defines depression as depressed mood or anhedonia, which is loss of interest or pleasure, for two weeks or longer, in addition to the presence of at least four of the following symptoms, substantial weight loss or gain, insomnia or hypersomnia, psychomotor agitation, fatigue or loss of energy, worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, diminished concentration, and indecisiveness. However, it remains controversial whether these criteria, validated in physically intact persons, can be used in stroke patients, especially in the acute setting. Thus, other interviewer-administered or self-completed depression case-finding 
or screening instruments are also used in the study of post-stroke depression. The prevalence of post-stroke depression ranges from 5 to 67%. The wide variability is due to different study settings, time since stroke, and the different criteria slash methods used to diagnose. A meta-analysis of 61 cohorts involving 25,488 patients published in 2014 indicated that 31% of patients develop depression at some point up to five years following stroke. Generally, the prevalence of major depression decreases over time. In one study, post-stroke depression was present in 50% of the patients in the acute phase, but only in 12% of the patients at a one-year follow-up. Another study reported the prevalence of depression as 30% at three months post-stroke. Of these patients, 60% were no longer depressed one year later. In the author's recent study involving 478 patients with acute stroke, approximately 57% had depression at the time of the stroke. This percentage rapidly decreased over time. Factors associated with post-stroke depression. Although various factors have been reported to be associated with post-stroke depression, the results have been inconsistent. A recent systematic review included 23 studies with 18,374 participants and reported that demographic characteristics, age and sex, were not consistently associated with post-stroke depression. There was also no consistent association between hemisphere of stroke, lesion location or pathological subtype and depression. A history of depression before stroke was associated with post-stroke depression in four of seven studies, while cognitive impairment was associated with depression in two of four studies. Based on the literature, the most consistent factors associated with post-stroke depression are severe stroke and early or late physical disability. In our recent study, changes in Montgomery Asberg depression scale scores were well correlated with improvements in neurological impairment. It seems that patients' acute depressive symptoms are related to physical dysfunction, while post-stroke depression at the chronic stage has an additional psychosocial component. Lesion location. Robinson emphasized the role of left frontal lesions in producing post-stroke depression. However, other studies have shown heterogeneous results and one systematic review failed to find an association between lesion location and post-stroke depression. We have shown that frontal lenticulocapsular brainstem based lesions are related to post-stroke depression. An important confounding factor in these studies is the variability in time since stroke. One study found that the association between left anterior cortical stroke and post-stroke depression was apparent at the acute stage, but not the subacute or chronic stages. Higher lesion volumes, cerebral atrophy, silent infarcts, and white matter lesions may also be associated with a higher risk of post-stroke depression. Pathophysiology. The close relationship between post-stroke depression and neurological deficits, and between changes in Montgomery Asberg depression scale scores and neurologic improvement, suggests that post-stroke depression may be a psychological reactive depressive symptom associated with sudden functional deficits. When there are prolonged functional deficits, subsequent familial and social issues may perpetuate post-stroke depression. The presence of post-stroke depression may also be dependent on the patient's personality traits and environmental factors, such as social support, economic matters, job stability, etc. However, there are still patients whose depression is not readily explained by neurological changes. For instance, patients with transient ischemic attacks or minor strokes can still have post-stroke depression. The possible role of anterior frontal lobe damage and the involvement of the frontal basal ganglia brainstem pathway in post-stroke depression development suggests alterations in neurotransmitter systems such as serotonergic, adrenergic, and dopaminergic systems. It is generally likely that patients with post-stroke depression have symptoms due to mixed mechanisms. Treatment. In 2008, two Cochrane reviews were published regarding the prevention and treatment of post-stroke depression. 
The authors identified 14 prevention trials involving 1,515 people and reported a small effect for psychological intervention. However, however, there was no evidence of an effect due to antidepressant drugs. Nevertheless, a few trials of antidepressant drugs published afterwards have shown some benefit of antidepressant drug use. The Cochrane Review of Treatment Trials identified 16 trials involving 1,655 subjects. Although antidepressant drugs in 13 trials produced improvements in depressive symptoms, it is uncertain whether they led to higher rates of remission for depression. The use of antidepressants increases gastrointestinal and central nervous system side effects. There was no evidence for effectiveness of psychological therapies alone for the treatment of post-stroke depression. Therefore, Although antidepressants seem to be effective for the treatment of post-stroke depression, the evidence is not robust. Nevertheless, European and American guidelines recommend pharmaceutical treatment, such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, or tricyclic antidepressant drugs for patients with post-stroke depression, along with monitoring for effectiveness and side effects. It is recommended that treatment be continued for at least six months after initial recovery. Summary. Post-stroke mood and emotional disturbances are common and manifest in diverse manners. The phenomenology, predicting factors, pathophysiology, and response to pharmacological treatments are different, although there are also factors that are in common. Post-stroke depression appears to be associated with complex pathophysiological mechanisms involving both psychological and psychiatric problems associated with patients' functional deficits and neurochemical changes secondary to brain damage. Therefore, although antidepressants and especially SSRIs are considered to be the management option of choice, their benefits are not robust. It remains uncertain whether pharmacological treatment in stroke patients is needed to prevent post-stroke depression or perhaps to improve neurological outcomes. Recognizing these emotional disturbances is important because they are often treatable. Proper management may improve patients' quality of life in a prolonged manner, even after the cessation of treatment. Undoubtedly, more research is needed to improve the management of post-stroke mood and emotional disturbances. The article above contains excerpts from Kim J, 2016, Post-Stroke Mood and Emotional Disturbances, Pharmacological Therapy Based on Mechanisms from the Journal of Stroke. To read the full article, you can visit the link below. If you are feeling as though you or someone you know is struggling with depression, please contact your GP or any of the services listed below. Stroke Recovery Association Telephone Counselling Line 1300-650-594 Lifeline 131114 or Beyond Blue 1300-224-767 Page four, free COVID-19 at home test for concession card holders. As of 24 January, 2022, concession card holders are able to access 10 rapid antigen COVID-19 home test kit from pharmacies. About the schemes, holders of the Commonwealth Senior Health Card, Department of Veteran Affairs Gold, White or Orange Card, Healthcare card, low income health card, and pensioner cards are eligible. You will need to show your Commonwealth concession card to a staff member to confirm your eligibility and make sure that you haven't exceeded your allocation of rapid tests. Each individual concession holder can access 10 rapid tests over a three month period. You will receive two rats at a minimum and can ask up to your monthly limit, five tests at one time. If you do not have a Commonwealth concession card, 
is the Service Australia website to check your eligibility. There are two key types of COVID-19 tests you can take at the moment. One, polymerase chain reaction test, PCR. PCR is a molecular test that analyzes a swab from your nose looking for a generic material from the virus that causes COVID-19. This test takes up to approximately 72 hours to return a positive or negative results and can detect even a small fragment of the virus. It is widely considered the most reliable way to test for COVID-19. Rapid antigen test. Rats. Rapid antigen test, rats detect protein known as antigen on the surface of the virus can return the results within 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the brand of test you use. While it's much faster than PCR tests, it's much less sensitive, meaning it could potentially return an incorrect result. Currently, the government consider a positive test from either PCR or approved rats to be sufficient proof of having COVID-19. Using home testing kit. Follow the instruction provided with the testing kit carefully. If you return a positive test, you must isolate at home and register a positive case with Service New South Wales. Reporting a positive case may enable you to access government benefits to help with loss income, access support services and more. New South Wales have penalties for failures to report positive case from a rat, so it's critical you report it as early as you can. If you return a negative result, check the current New South Wales health guideline to see if you need to isolate or monitor for symptoms. Speak to your GP over the phone if you are symptomatic, but test negative for advice on what to do. Concerns over stock. The program will commence at participating community pharmacies on 24th of January. However, with supplies of tests in high demands across the globe and distribution delays due to worker shortage, it is unclear whether tests will be available for concession holders. Before making a trip to your pharmacy, ensure you confirm if they are participating in the program and have stock available. This article is reproduced with permission from National Senior Australia. Page five, wheelchair friendly beaches. To enhance the beach going experience for people with disability, beach wheelchairs are now available at a number of new locations. They provide and improve access to the beach and ocean with both children and adult size options to allow children in particular to have access to and be included in a range of activities such as playing in the waves and exploring rock formations, usually found at the end of beach. Each summer, ideas are happy to learn of additions to accessible beach facilities as new equipment becomes available and destinations strive to be inclusive. Here is a roundup of the newest additions at accessible beaches. Ballina Lighthouse Beach and Avoca Beach have accessible beach matting. Bait Haven, adult and child chair available for hire at Clyde View Holiday Park. The chairs are also next to Corrigan's Reserve where the accessible playground is located. Phone 02-4472-4224. Batemans Bay Surf Life Saving Club, the clubhouse on George Bass Drive, Malua Bay, has one chair with smooth tyres. Bondi Beach, the previously accessible promenade and ramp access, now have added improvements to portable beach access matting. The matting is at the northern end of the beach. Access matting is rolled out, weather and surf permitting, on Thursdays and Saturdays from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Beach wheelchairs must be pre-booked on 02-9083-8400 or through email at 
B-O-N-D-I-P-A-V at W-A-V-E-R-L-E-Y dot N-S-W dot G-O-V dot A-U. Ramsgate Avenue, close to the accessible and ambulant toilets. An accessible shower is located at Bondi Pavilion. Brow Lee Surfers Surf Life Saving Club. Free to hire with donations welcome. Two chairs with smooth tyres are available at the Surf Life Saving Club at the southern end of Heath Street, Brow Lee. Phone 02447166657. Fingal Bay Beach. Accessible beach matting and Novi chair floating beach wheelchair available. This matting is rolled out during the lifeguard patrols. Wheelchair accessible bathrooms and showers are also available. A hoist is available on site. Malabar Beach Randwick, a permanent wheelchair access with Moby matting. Maruya Surf Life Saving Club, Clubhouse, Charles Moffat Drive, Maruya Heads, phone 02-44-74-2671. Naruma Surf Life Saving Club at the clubhouse on Main Beach, Wilcox Avenue, Naruma, 02-44-76-1745. North Wollongong Beach, Stewart Park. Toilet facility has an adult lift and change table. Shell Harbour City, New South Wales, North Beach has the provision of Moby matting and beach wheelchairs. A beach wheelchair is also available at Orilla Beach. The chairs are available when lifeguards are on patrol. Bookings are not required. However, a combination code is needed for access. To obtain the access code, please see one of the on-duty lifeguards or contact customer services on 4221-6111. Both beaches also have accessible parking and toilets. South Cronulla Beach, accessible beach matting and beach wheelchairs are available for hire. Bookings are essential for use of these facilities. Lifeguards must be on duty with a maximum time of four hours with one ship wheelchair per person. The matting is available on request every day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. during summertime and 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. during winter. The Rule and Austinmere beaches. Beach matting and beach-friendly wheelchairs are available at The Rule and Port Kembla. Wheelchairs can be used during patrol hours. To book a wheelchair, call 02 4227. 7268. Austinmere Beach has an adult lift and change table. Tawoon Bay Beach. Accessible beach matting is available every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. All summer season ending the 29th of April. Access to beach wheelchairs is available during patrol hours. Contact Tawoon Bay Surf Life Saving Club to arrange. Further information can be found by calling to Woon Bay Surf Life Saving Club. Turos Beach Holiday Park. Beach wheelchair. Bookings are required. Please call 02-4473-8236. This article was reproduced from Ideas. A full list of accessible beaches. Go to the website below. Page six, Board of Directors 2022. At the annual general meeting held on 3rd of December, 2021, members voted in the 2022 Board of Directors for the Stroke Recovery Association. We are proud to present the Stroke Recovery Association 2022 Board of Directors, Mr. David Bostock, Mr. John Garbett, Mrs. Linda Glanfield, Mrs. Judith Thornley, 
Ms. Pam Short, Mrs. Judy Sumner, and Mr. Shi Chang Ming Wang. Thank you to our returning board members and welcome to those who are joining the board for the first time this year. We look forward to a successful and exciting 2022. Welcome to new board members. The association would like to introduce the newest members of the board of directors for 2022, Mr. David Bostock and Mrs. Judy Sumner. You can read a bit about the newest board members below. David Bostock from the Working Age Group Stroke Central Coast. David Bostock is a stroke survivor who had his stroke in 2003 at the age of 39. He is the current co-chair and co-president of the Working Age Group Stroke WAGS on the Central Coast, a group that he has been a member of since 2006. In 2008, David met his lovely partner Jane and managed to convince her to leave her home state of Tasmania to move to the central coast of New South Wales. They married in 2012 and are very happy together. In 2007, David's stroke story became a central part of the Cancer Council's warnings of smoking related stroke and an advertising campaign titled The Voice Within was launched nationally. He was the consumer presenter at the 2008 Smart Strokes Conference and again at the Stroke Recovery Association's 2008 Creating Connections Stroke Conference. In 2018, he appeared as a stroke survivor in the New South Wales Ambulance Service training video for the Hunter 8. This is the pre-hospital acute triage protocol, which is now used by New South Wales Ambulance to assist first responder paramedics in recognising the early signs of stroke reducing pre-hospital and emergency department delays for patients and increasing their access to thrombolytic therapy in an acute stroke care setting. David also appears on Central Coast TV, radio and print whenever a stroke survivor story is required. David continues to enjoy his time with the working age group, Stroke, WAGS and at the association. The very popular Sip and Nibbles Working Age Online Stroke Group began at David's suggestion and he continues to host this uproariously funny group on the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month. Page seven, welcome to new board members. Judy Sumner, Tamworth Stroke Recovery Club. Judy Sumner is the Vice President and Assistant Treasurer of the Tamworth Stroke Recovery Club. She became a member of the association in 2004 after her husband, Alan, experienced a stroke in his mid forties. Judy was working, managing her own business and still had one of her three children at school during this time. The impact of Alan's stroke on the family was immediate as Judy was unable to continue work due to the severity of his stroke. Alan was hospitalized in Tamworth for five months and was confined to a wheelchair for over five years. However, with Judy's attentive care, he continued to improve and was able to walk with the assistance of a walking stick. Unfortunately, in 2015, Alan had a second stroke, which left him more dependent on Judy's support and assistance with daily activities. As part of her role within the Tamworth Stroke Recovery Club, Judy, along with her fellow volunteers, is responsible for organising the main fundraising events for the club. The proceeds of this contributes to the many bus outings for the members of the Tamworth Club. Judy regularly organises the club's involvement in the Hunter Stroke Olympics and is hoping to assist the club to travel to the combined club's morning teas and other Stroke Recovery Association events this year. Both Judy and Alan are regular attendees of the association's online stroke support groups. Judy believes that these groups have been essential for Alan to continue to connect with other survivors during COVID-19 lockdowns. Connecting with the Maitland Aphasia Communications Group online has been a huge bonus for Alan as he feels supported, safe to be able to speak up and at ease while meeting with other people who have aphasia. Judy believes that Alan has also benefited from meeting with the Working Age online group 
as he now realises that he is not the only person of a younger age to have experienced a stroke. Judy is excited to be part of the board of the association as she believes that the association will benefit from having a rural representative. She is committed to the association continuing to work in the virtual world as this has opened up a whole new support network for her husband, Alan. Thank you to our upcoming board members. The staff and board of the association would like to take this opportunity to thank our outgoing board members. Mr. Stuart Chalmers, OAM, who served on the board from 2001 to 2021, and Mr. Jim Towers, who served on the board from 2017 to 2021, for their many years of service and contributions to the association. Stuart will remain an active member of the Belmont Stroke Recovery Club and the Hunter Stroke Olympics Committee. The association would like to send their deepest appreciation and thanks to these long-serving board members. On pages eight and nine of Stroke Recovery News, we have a celebration of photos to the 45 years of the Stroke Recovery Association. 2022 marks 45 years of the Stroke Recovery Association New South Wales. To celebrate, we are looking back at some special moments over the past 45 years. The first photo is of Anita Rosenberg enjoying Stroke Awareness Week in 1987. The second photo is of one of our group in the early 90s working with a speech pathologist doing speech practice and exercise. Down on the next line, we have a lovely photo of Anita Rosenberg, one of the association's founders. Next to Anita, we have a presentation of donation in 1985. The next photo is a photo of the current Chief Executive Officer, Michelle Sharkey, presenting the Kintetsu Japanese Friendship Group, a present in 2000 when they visited Australia. Down on the next line, we have a harbour cruise that was taken by members of the association in 1982. Next to that is a lovely photo of the opening of the association's offices when they first opened in 1982. Going over to page nine, we have a lovely photo of the Stroke Olympics in 2000. Next to that, we have a photo of Stroke Seminar. On the next photo down on the left is a lovely photo of the then governor with a number of people from the association and some health professionals. We have Robin Artlett, who was the then president of the Stroke Recovery Association, Professor Kate Storey from Royal North Shore Hospital, Alison Wilson, who was the CNC of the Concord Rehabilitation Hospital Stroke Unit. Next to her is Her Excellency, and next to that is Michelle Sharkey, the current CEO of the association. Over on the next photo, in 2010, when we launched the Stroke Awareness Week, at Government House. In that photo, we have Linda Glanfield, the current Secretary Treasurer of the Association, Robin Artlett, the then President of the Association, Michelle Sharkey, the current CEO, Marie Bashir, and three health professionals. On the next line down, we have a photo of the City to Surf team in 2011 to raise money for the Association. From left to right, we have Eileen Leather. We have Mr. Wentworth Wood, who was a member of the Hawkesbury Club. We have our current president, Mr. John Garbett, and Wentworth's then wife, who unfortunately has passed away. The next photo, the crowd that attended the Creating Connections Conference at Burwood in 2014. Underneath that, we have a lovely photo of the SRA 40th celebrations in 2017. So in that photo, you have the then Governor, His Excellency David Hurley, two of our founding members, Ros Oliver and Mr Alan Rosenberg. Next, we have a lovely photo of the, the combined choir at the Stroke Recital in 2018. In the next photo at the bottom of the right-hand side of the page, is a photo of celebration of the 20 years Sydney Stroke Olympics in 2021. And it's a lovely photo of our president, John Garbett, surrounded by 
Lynn and John Lawrence. Page 10, President's Report 2021. The latter part of 2020 was quite disappointing for all who were part of the association with the cancellation of many of our flagship events due to COVID-19. The new year of 2021 began with such promise and it was hoped that the ongoing lockdowns were behind us. We did manage to reactivate the stroke recovery clubs and groups and hold two major events prior to COVID-19 raising its ugly head again. I congratulate my fellow board members, the staff and our wonderful stroke recovery club and group volunteers for their initiative and ongoing commitment to the association. It has taken an enormous amount of energy to keep going with the ups and downs of the present health crisis, which appears to be here to stay for the foreseeable future. The organised events of the association and the activities of our stroke recovery clubs and groups were recommenced in late 2020. However, many did not get up and running again until early 2021. Whilst most of our organised events scheduled for the latter half of 2020 were cancelled, the Building Capacity Training Conference scheduled for May 2021 and the Sydney Stroke Olympic Games Day scheduled for June 2021 were able to proceed as normal. The association services in review. The staff have continued to work extremely hard through the challenges of COVID-19 to ensure the services of the association continue to be relevant for members. The performance of the association continues to be a source of pride for all involved. The association statistics indicate that the services and programs are continuing to perform well. Support and information. This aspect of the association's work has continued to be a vital service for survivors of stroke and their carers. The enduring difficulties accessing the health, NDIS and aged care systems have highlighted the ongoing need for our telephone support and counselling line. The calls are usually complex as those experiencing the impact of stroke on their lives for the first time often have a more limited time in the acute and rehab settings, leading to a greater need for information and support to understand the changes in their lives. I trust you have all had the opportunity to experience the new Stroke Recovery Association website the association staff and our website designer have worked diligently to ensure that we have improved the capability of the website to meet AA accessibility standards. This has resulted in a website that is generally more welcoming and open to all who are seeking information about the association, our services and stroke. We have also introduced a members only section of the website which gives access to recordings of the guest presentations from our conferences and Topical Thursday online groups. These can be accessed by members who are unable to attend or who may wish to view the presentations again. Support of stroke recovery clubs and groups. The association was successful in obtaining a further grant from the Information Linkages and Capacity Building Program for a two year stroke connectivity project. This has seen the development of a training program to be implemented at stroke recovery clubs and groups to assist members to further develop skills in accessing and utilizing the internet and online platforms. We are particularly looking to increase participation levels of our members in the online stroke support groups as a result of this project. The Building Capacity Training Conference was held in May 2021 and was successfully live streamed to all our members who were unable to attend in person. Many of our stroke recovery clubs and groups were represented at the two-day conference held in Parramatta for the first time. In May 2022, the association will hold this conference again, which will coincide with celebrations for the association's 45th birthday. The October 2021 club video conferences were able to proceed and it is envisaged that these will be held using the online video conferencing system Zoom going forward. More frequent communication between the clubs and groups and the association is vital given the continually changing requirements of COVID-19.
The number of online stroke support groups has continued to expand this year. Many stroke clubs and groups are now experimenting with opening their groups to both online and face-to-face -face attendees. Working with our partner organisation Interreach Griffith, we have extended the Griffith Stroke Group to our members online as the Rural and Remote Online Group. The Maitland Aphasia Communications Group have also opened their weekly meetings to other members to attend online. Technology enables members to attend these groups no matter where they are located throughout New South Wales. Other online groups which continue to be successful are the SIP and Nibbles Working Age Group, facilitated by David Bostock, the Topical Thursday Guest Speaker Sessions, and Trivia Tuesday. The staff are working closely with many of our lovely volunteers to enable them to use their skills to facilitate the online groups. Stroke Awareness and Education. Stroke Awareness and Education is an area that has been greatly reduced due to the impact of the lockdowns this year. Most clubs slash groups were unable to participate in Stroke Awareness Week 2021 due to COVID-19. The annual Stroke Awareness Week launch and the Stroke Choir Recital were both cancelled due to COVID-19 and the inability of venues to accommodate guests for an event. Community talks and education opportunities have also been reduced. Advocacy. Inclusion on various committees and consultation groups ensure that the Chief Executive Officer continues to be very active in advocating for services at all level governments. Many advocacy consultation groups and committees have continued to meet during 2021 using online platforms. Areas in which we have significant input have included the development of the New South Wales Health Telestroke Project through the ACA Stroke Network and the Transport New South Wales rollout of the new train fleets and other transport related policies through the Accessible Transport Advisory Committee. This is an important aspect of the association's mandate. We will continue to be involved with New South Wales Health and Transport New South Wales with the provision of the consumer representative. As your president, I will continue to provide a vital voice within the health consumer New South Wales, serving as their chairperson again in 2021. Moving forward, on the 21st of December 2021, we will lose the New South Wales government funding that was reinstated from the Department of Communities and Justice in June 2020. This is a funding source that we have received well over 25 years. The staff have provided an excellent tender for the continuation of this funding, but we do not expect to hear the outcome of this tenure until early 2022. Irrespective of whether we receive this funding, the association still see advocacy as a core component of our service provision. We are committed along with our partner organisation within the Disability Advocacy Alliance to ensuring that the needs of people with disability are at the forefront of decision making. In 2022, you will be assured that your staff and board of management will continue to work with stroke survivors and their carers to ensure that the interests and the voices of stroke survivors will be heard within the decision-making process of New South Wales. As we move into 2021-2022, we can look back on the past 12 months with enormous pride with the achievement of this association. We have not only adapted the ever-changing and trying to conditions of COVID-19, but we have risen to the challenge and found new and improved ways of engaging with and provide services to our members. The Stroke Connectivity Project will continue in 2022. This will bring staff 
from the association out to your groups and clubs where you will have an opportunity to engage with the association staff directly. Going forward, all the association's education conference will be live streamed to those who are unable to attend the event in a face-to-face -face capacity. Staff and members are becoming much more at ease with the online platform and will continue to be used as we develop more ways of engaging directly with you. The use of technology will become an increasingly valued tool to ensure that you enjoy greater access to the service and events made available by the association, wherever you live. We will continue to work on our governance procedures to ensure compliance with all relevant authorities and to evaluate our service to ensure they are meeting the needs of survivors as they evolve over time. Thank you. A huge thank you to all individuals and organizations who have contributed to our success, whether that be contribution of their skills to volunteering or as a member of staff. Thank you also to all members of the board for their ongoing contribution. John Jarvis, President. Page 13, Financial Position. On this page, you will see a number of graphs and images that explain the association's financial position. The first graph on the top left-hand side of the page shows income distribution for 2020 and 2021. The largest percentage of income was received from subsidies and grants at 55%, followed by club contributions and income, 26%, government stimulus packages, 11%, donations and bequests, 4%, other income, 2%, interest, 1%, and memberships, also 1%. Next to this graph on the right hand side of the page, you will see the expenses of 2020 and 2021 financial year. The most significant expense is the employee cost of 58%, operational costs at 20%, programs at 9%, and clubs and groups at 13%. The net position of the 2020 and 2021 financial year is a surplus of $250,076. On the bottom half of the page, you will see the statistics from the last financial year, which was 2019 to 2020. On the bottom left-hand side of the page, you will see the income from 2019-2020 financial year. Subsidies and grants counted for 72% of income, followed by government stimulus of 15%, interest of 5%, memberships 3%, donations and bequests also 3% and other income 2%. Next to this is the graph on expenses on the right hand side of the page for the financial year 2019 to 2020. 74% of the expenses were employee cost, followed by 19% operational, 4% clubs and groups, and 3% programs. In the 2019-2020 financial year, the association had a net position of a deficit of $67,490. Page 14, Treasurer's Report for 2021. At the conclusion of the 2020-2021, the association remains in an excellent financial position. The financial overview gives you a compact picture of how monies have been received and expended over the past year and a comparison with the previous financial year. The information is slightly skewed as this is the first time that we have incorporated the individual stroke recovery club bank accounts as part of the reports. Therefore, the operating profit of $250,076 is considerably larger than expected. The income and expenditure report indicates that there has been a decrease in monies from memberships and fundraising over the past year. However, there is an increase in all other forms of income. 
the association received $31,755 in bequests over the past financial year, an increase of over 173%, and has been notified of an additional bequest we can expect to receive in 2021-2022. Due to the current low interest rate, our investments have returned a decreased performance. The overall annual expenditure in 2021 increased due to higher staffing levels. Staff have worked diligently to source alternative sources of funding, and this is reflected in the extension of grants from the New South Wales Health and a grant from NDIS for the 2020-2022 period. The association has benefited substantially from the federal government stimulus programs, resulting in an additional $81,507 in 2020-2021. Moving forward, as we move into 2021 and 2022 financial year, we are in a very strong and viable financial position with a total cash reserve of $1,511,388, an increase of $294,171 or 24% on last year's position. Please note, this increase also incorporates the monies held in the Stroke Recovery Club bank accounts, which amounts to $204,319, or 70% of that yearly increase. This is a substantial amount, as this is the first time these monies have been included in our audited statements. And this has been required by the Australian Not-for-Profit and Charities Commission. Our funding agreement with New South Wales Health is secured until 2023. However, the funding for our advocacy and information program through the New South Wales government is only guaranteed until 31st of December 2021. The new disability advocacy funding program was announced in September 2021 and the CEO has submitted a tender application for continued funding. However, the outcome of this is expected to be known in 2022. Staff were successful in securing $40,000 in funding from the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice Social Sector Transformation Fund, which will be spent over the next financial year. A further six months extension of the NDIS grant to roll out the Stroke Connectivity Training Project was also granted. Our retained revenue will be managed carefully to enable the association to continue to grow and move forward. Some of this cash reserve has been used to employ a further administrative support for the association's office. This is an expense that we will continue to incur in future years. The board is acutely aware of the ever increasing legislative burden on the association and our clubs. It is imperative that the board monitors the spending of monies diligently to ensure that our legal obligations are fulfilled. It is vital that we maintain our status as a charity and strictly comply with the new processes of the Australian Not-for-Profit and Charities Commission. Members can feel assured that the financial diligence is a primary concern of the board. The CEO has now been added to the signatory on 90% of all club bank accounts, and we will be completing that process in the 2021-2022 period. Thank you. I would again like to express our appreciation to our honorary auditor, Mr. Vishal Modi from Mexia. A copy of the independent auditor's report is included on page 18 of this report. I would also like to acknowledge the extra work undertaken by our financial manager, Cheryl Smith, who has worked diligently to ensure we comply with the requirements of the Australian Not-for-Profit Charities Commission. Linda Glanfield, Secretary Treasurer. Page 15. Has stroke impacted your capacity to work? The financial impact of not being able to work due to stroke can be significant. Day-to-day -day expenses are likely to continue and you will probably also face additional costs for medical treatments and tests, causing financial worry and stress. AFRM Claims Advocacy, ACA, has reached out to the Stroke Recovery Association New South Wales 
to offer SRA members a free assessment to find out if they are owed payments from their personal insurance. Although the initial assessment is free, there may be costs associated with this service if you are successful in receiving an insurance payout. Do I qualify? Has stroke impacted your ability to work, even if it happened years ago? You might have personal insurance in your superannuation that could possibly owe you an insurance payment. ACA can assist you to check whether you can access this payment to alleviate financial stress. Alternatively, you may choose to explore your personal insurance yourself. Did you know? Personal insurance benefit payments are intended to support you if you are injured or become ill. To make it easy for you, ACA can find out if you are owed payments or not based on your situation. You've most likely been paying for your personal insurance via your superannuation fund, e.g. income protection. You may be owed insurance payments, whether your injury was recent or happened many years ago. ACA's initial assessment to find out if you are owed a benefit payment will cost you nothing. Personal insurance can still be paid even if you already receive payments from injury compensation schemes or are a participant in the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS. The Stroke Recovery Association and ACA have come together to inform our members of this option and hopefully assist in alleviating some of the financial stress experienced by those who are not able to work or have reduced their working capacity. ACA have assisted hundreds of clients to get an insurance benefit payment and may be able to assist you too. To find out if ACA can assist, visit www.afrmclaimsadvocacy.com forward slash Stroke Recovery Association. Call 1300 013 328 or email aca at afrm.com.au. Please note that AFRM Claims Advocacy is a commercial service and there may be costs associated with this service after the initial free assessment if you are successful in receiving an insurance payout. The information in this article may be beneficial to some of our members. However, should be used for information purposes only and is not endorsed by the Stroke Recovery Association. The Stroke Recovery Association New South Wales is not responsible for any fees incurred by any individual that chooses to utilise the services that AFRM claims advocacy provide. Page 16. On the right hand side of the page, we have our current board of the association. Our president, John Garbett, vice president, Judith Thornley, secretary treasurer, Linda Glanfield, public officer, Michelle Sharkey, OAM, and directors, David Bostock, Pam Short, Judy Sumner, Professor Ming Shi Chang Wang. You will also find our contact information on this page. To contact us at the association, our phone number is 1300-650-594. Our email is info at strokensw.org.au. Our postal address is PO Box 3401, Putney, New South Wales, the postcode is 2112. If you would like to connect with us on social media, our Facebook page is Stroke Recovery Association. Our Instagram page is at Stroke NSW. Our website is www.strokensw.org.au. And our Twitter account is at Stroke NSW. Memorial donations. The passing of a family member, friend or loved one is a very sad and stressful time. Sometimes symbolic gestures and actions 
provide great comfort to those who are grieving. It is with gratitude that the Stroke Recovery Association receives donations in memoriam. These donations, which assist us to continue our valuable work, are a wonderful remembrance of the person who has passed away. All donations received by the association are tax deductible and can be forwarded to our postal address above. Acknowledgement will be sent to the family of the deceased. The association is happy to provide memorial donation pamphlets, which can be made available at a funeral service with prepaid address envelopes. Thank you for your support. The staff of the association, Chief Executive Officer, Michelle Sharkey, OAM, Office and Communications Manager, Rachel Field, Financial Manager, Cheryl Smith, Administrative Assistant, Carolyn Armstrong, and Stroke Project Officer, Maria Nguyen. Disclaimer and copyright. The views expressed in Stroke Recovery News are not necessarily those of the Stroke Recovery Association nor its board. No liability or responsibility is accepted by the publisher for any consequences resulting from any action taken based on information or advertisements included herein. All care is taken to ensure the accuracy of the contents, but this cannot be guaranteed and should not be relied upon. The publisher of Stroke Recovery News is the Stroke Recovery Association of New South Wales. No part of this publication may be reproduced either in print or any other media, including the internet, without the written authorization of the executive officer of the Stroke Recovery Association. Permission should be sought by writing to PO Box 3401, Putney, New South Wales 2112, or info at strokensw.org.au. Thank you for listening to the summer autumn edition of Stroke Recovery News 2022. If you have any questions about the content in this newsletter or would like to discuss any information further, please contact the association.